Okay, yes, do this. Do this. Nasir, show him why dragons are known for their wrath. There we go. And that's why Wrath Resolve is awesome. So yeah, that is why I saved that combination for Nasir over at this point. So... On normal or easy, this is where this chapter ends. On hard mode though, this is where the final battle really begins. This is why I chose to play hard mode, by the way, because what happens now is exclusive to this difficulty. Ashnard is about to touch the medallion. Remember what that did to Ike's father? Imagine what it... They said before that the medallion takes the worst aspects of a person and magnifies them tenfold. I also love the evil promotion animation he gets here. Imagine what that would do to this guy. Seems like his mount uh, got the benefit of that too. And hard mode is the only time you'll see this portrait. This is Berserk Ashnard, the real final boss of the game. And yet many people speculate the only reason Ashnard manages to remain at least somewhat in control after touching the medallion is that he was already insane to begin with. Now, at this point, you get the option to call one of the Lagoo's royals to fight with you. On normal and easy, this choice happens at the beginning of the final chapter, so they get much more of a chance to contribute. On hard though, they only get to contribute to the next fa to the second phase of the final boss fight, and that's it. So, we get three choices here, Tibar, Nasala, or Githka, or this, but that's kind of stupid, don't choose this option. And I'm going to go over all three of them now. The first thing I should mention about the Lagoos Royals is that all three of them come with a Lagoos Band, which allows them to remain in animal form permanently. Also, all three of them are able to damage Ashnard. So that's all of their similarities, now what about their differences? First there's Tibarn. I've taken some liberties with his and Nasala's class names because they're not actually called this in-game, however Tibarn and Nasala's Hawk and Raven classes are actually different to the generic Hawk and Ravens. They have slightly different transform bonuses and maximum stats, so for the sake of convenience, I'm referring to them by their Radiant Dawn class names. On to Tibarn himself. He's the in-between option of the three Lagoos Royals, having a good balance of power and speed. His strength is extremely high, he has great skill, and his speed is decent by regular enemy standards, but not enough to double Ashnard, even with the speed wing you get from Bryce. He also has a good amount of bulk. And unlike Gifka, he can fly over terrain. For all three of the Lagoos Royals, I've listed how much damage they do to Ashnard, because on hard mode, that's really the only thing that matters. On normal and easy, you get to choose between them when the chapter begins, which makes them a lot more useful. Against Ashnard, Tibarn is very middle of the road. 10 damage per turn isn't all that impressive, especially given that he can never have Wrath or Resolve thanks to joining in the middle of a chapter. That being said though, Tibarn probably has the best skill setup of any of the Lagoos Royals. Saver is amazing if you need an emergency getaway from Ashnard, and Cancel is incredibly good. That is a 36% chance of not taking damage. Overall, Tibarn is probably the best option defensively, and if you want a good balance of speed and power. The Backstabber is finally on your side, if you choose to use him. While Tibarn was the balanced one, Nasala is all about speed. His main gimmick is that with his base of 34 speed, he is guaranteed to double any Beorc enemy. Which just so happens to include Ashnard, as well as pretty much everything in the trial maps. To compensate though, Nasala is the weakest of the three royals in terms of actual strength. 
And even with guaranteed doubling, he does the least damage to Ashnard out of all three. So from a purely objective standpoint, he's probably the worst of the Lagoos Royals to pick here. His skill setup isn't that great, Vantage is nice, but Vortex is unlikely to be all that useful. It does a ranged attack with the same stats as Elwind, which means it's magical, and it can only be used on the player phase. It doesn't work on Ash Knight at all though. Also, he kind of suffers in the bond support department. Two of his bond supports are with NPCs who never fight. Nasawa also has the worst defenses of the three, and even with his massive speed, his luck is worse than Tibon, so the two have pretty much equal evasion overall. Nasala does have the most room to grow out of the three royals though, but that mostly applies if you're playing on easy or normal. But if Nasala gains just one point of strength, he is tying with Tiban for damage to Ashnard, and you can use an energy drop to raise his damage even more, but you might as well use that energy drop on Tiban and have the same effects. Overall, Nasala is the worst of the three royals against Ashnard, but if you like doubling things in the trial maps, he's a good option. Also, he comes with a coin in his inventory, so if you're doing a transfer file, that gives Ike's convoy one more coin for Radiant Dawn. Givka is the most unique of the royals, given that he is the only way you'll ever see a lion in this game. Givka is also the only one of your three options who can't fly, which sets him back a little bit. He makes up for this, however, by having the most strength of them all by far. In fact, his strength starts out at the maximum possible strength stat you can have in this game. And he doesn't really sacrifice on speed either, he's pretty fast. And if you use the speed wing from Bryce on him, he'll double regular Ashnard. Unfortunately, not Berserk Ashnard though. His massive strength combined with his powerful Fang weapon means that Gifka deals the most damage to Ashnard out of all three of her options. So objectively speaking, he's probably the best choice here. But you have to remember that he won't be able to fly. He does have 9 movement compared to the other Royals 8 though. Also, his starting skill is pretty bad, it's just raw. He's also very bulky too, so think of Gifka like a very fast general who hits much harder and has insane movements. Though, like all three of the Lagoos Royals, he suffers from having no 1-2 to two range counterattack options. That's really the main flaw all of them, and by extension all Lagoos have. There are also a couple of secondary benefits to choosing Gifka. One of them is that he's the only one of the three whose portrait in the illustration gallery doesn't unlock unless you pick him. And the second is that since he starts at level 20 with cap strength, Simply choosing him here guarantees Gifka plus 2 strength in Radiant Dawn, if you're doing a transfer file that is. For his high damage to Ashnard and the fact he's the only way you'll ever see a lion fight, many players choose Gifka here. Okay, so having gone over all of them, who am I going to choose? Well, I have a clear favourite out of these three. I guess I should say I have a clear least favourite. I love Tiban, he's an awesome character, but you already get two hawks. You don't get a lion or a raven. So Tiban is always my the last choice on my list here. Gifka is also great, he's the only lion you get, he's very powerful. Objectively speaking against Ashnard, he's probably the best of the three. However, story-wise, I really like to bring Nasala here. I know that from a gameplay standpoint, he's easily the worst of the three, but... I feel like I like to give Nasala a chance to redeem himself, and he's always been the most interesting character to me out of all these three, and I feel like this just makes sense from a story standpoint, and you know, he really shouldn't be on the sidelines here. He should take this chance to redeem himself. Also, his dialogue is hilarious. This is also a benefit of picking him. So yeah, the dialogue is slightly different uh, if uh, you're on hard mode and you're fighting Berserk Ashnard. So yeah, Nasala's reaction to fighting Berserk Ashnard is particularly funny. So, here we are, real final phase of the final battle. Berserk Ashnard, who looks terrifying. So, fitting with his philosophy, his strength is now maxed, but his defense isn't any higher. His speed is exactly one point higher, but it doesn't mean that he's going to really double all that much. And he now has 80 HP, so Ashnard in total effectively has um, 
effectively has 140 HP on this mode, and he doesn't have any new skills. Uh, one thing that I should probably mention is that technically speaking, Ashnard can learn the stun skill, but you don't ever have a chance to use an occult scroll on him, so yeah. Anyway, Berserk Ashnard. Really? He isn't that different to regular Ashnard. Um, I feel like they deliberately didn't raise his defense, because if they did, he'd probably be like, a lot more frustrating to fight. Now, here's the thing, as much as I love, like, look at this, okay. This is what Nasir's stats look like with Resolve active. So, he's now hitting just as hard as Ashnard did in his previous form. And yeah, that's a lot more damage. However, in fact, I just realized that's kind of a good thing because Ashnard now has exactly enough power to put Nasir in guaranteed Resolve Wrath range with every single attack, so... Maybe your increased strength is going to work against you here. Which almost seems kind of like a fitting way for you to go out. Now, before I heal Nasir, I'm actually going to have Ike attack Ashnard, because... It'll be more efficient to heal both of them. Okay, yeah. So now, yeah, you're guaranteed to put Ike in Wrath Resolve range if he had that. Also, the music is slightly different here. But unfortunately, you get to hear the full intro. And now you really need to make sure that you heal every turn. Let me just make sure you're both in range. Good. I need to use this at least once. Let's go for it. Even though this is pretty much overkill, this is full healing on everyone in your army, regardless of where they are on the map. Like, pretty much every s rank staff. And obviously, I don't want to have Nasir attack on the player phase. Oh, right, I forgot to even move Nasala. Uh, yeah, to be honest, Nasala's not going to really do all that much in this fight. He is the only person in the game who doubles Ashnard, and he'll double Ashnard in both of his forms. 34 speed, and I know I will have already said this in the bio, but uh, from my perspective, I haven't recorded the bio yet. Uh, Nasir... Nasala's speed is exactly enough so that he will double any Bjork. Because the maximum speed any Bjork can have is 30, you need 4 higher speed to double, and Nasala has 34 speed, so yeah, he doubles everyone. But he's... Oh, he's the weakest of the three, and against Ashnard, Nasala only does 8 damage with doubling, whereas Tiban does 10 without doubling, and Gifka does 15, if I'm getting that right. If you gave Nasala an energy drop, he would technically do just as much damage as Tiban, but then again, you could just give Tiban an energy drop, and Tiban would do more, but anyway, that ends my brief analysis of those. I just, I like Nasala being here for story purposes. So, the first phase of the... Oh no, Ashnard, please don't do what I think you're going to do. Oh yeah, and he heals 8 per turn, so yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry, holy god. Wow, he doesn't even get a generic boss quote. I guess Ashnard stops having boss dialogue after uh, he goes in. I no, he doesn't, because, uh, because the Lagoos Royals do, but... Okay, I didn't want you to do that, because now I need to have Mist run, because you're now in range of Mist. So, I should have called off that Holy Guard. That was probably a bad idea. Hmm. I might have Nasala fight Ashnard just once. Unfortunately, then I'm going to have to retreat him because I don't want Ashnard to be attacking Nasala every turn. Because that would mean that, um, I mean, I want him to be attacking uh, Nasir. Oh boy, okay. Um, that's not good. I just realized that. Okay, I can't attack with Nasir now, because then he'll untransform. Uh, and he won't be able to use a Lagoose Stone uh, this turn. So, what I will do is, I will wait for Ashnard to potentially attack him, or for him to untransform on his own. Then, next turn, I will Lagoose Stone him. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. For now, though, Ike's going to attack again. You can get Aether once. Come on, Ike. I do love the massively loud voomph sound that Nashdard sword makes whenever it attacks anyone. Mainly doing this for the special boss dialogue. So the Lagoos Royals have slightly different boss quotes against um, Ashnard if he's Berserk. So Nasala, I think, just says, seeing you makes me want to forget this whole thing. He doesn't say like this if Ashnard isn't Berserk. Oh no. Please tell me he's not gonna do it. <laughs> we should have seen this coming. Or not. 
Yep, this is the one time he's not gonna betray us. <laughs> yeah, I like that boss conversation because they fake you out by me by making you think that is gonna betray you, but then nope, he's gonna be perfectly loyal now. Right, uh, yeah, this is a problem. I'm actually gonna just try and, um... Oh, wait, Ike's over there. I can sort of try and box you in, but... Yeah, and I have to make sure that you don't attack. But yeah, that's not gonna really change much because you're still not blocked going down. And the bishop hasn't spawned. I, I, the moment that I say that, the bishop's gonna spawn. But Jill's gonna go up there just in case uh, he does spawn this turn, which he might. And, uh... I need to use this, because otherwise, um... You know what, I might... Uh, yeah, I should do that. Please tell me that that hit both Nasir and... Well, actually, wait, no, Nasir didn't. Ike was the one who needed to get hit by that. Yeah, I believe that Mist has special dialogue against Ashnard as well, but um, obviously you really, really don't want her to fight him. As I said, he has tons of special boss dialogue, but, um... Yeah, you won't really be able to see much of it. And you don't need to worry about turn count in this chapter. There's no bonus experience this time, because obviously, um, yeah. Huh, that's... Why didn't you attack Nasala? Nasala's much less of a threat to you. Going berserk has made you an idiot, Ashnard, because attacking a seer like this, that guarantees Wrath Resolve, and that happens. I almost don't want... I, I, I really want Ike to be the one to finish this, but I also like the... As I was saying, the bishop will spawn whenever I... Yeah, so I attempted fate, but this guy will heal Ashnard. There's also a bunch of paladins up here, but... I mean, I suppose if I had Titania up here, she could maybe get to level 20, but oh well, I guess that's the benefit of hindsight. Forgot there were paladins, but let's just get rid of you. In my previous playthrough, I forgot this guy spawned, and he did end up healing Ashnard quite a few times, and the final boss took ages, so I'm learning from my own mistakes here. Pretty sure Ashnard can't reach Jill from up there. Oh, he's almost in range of Valencia, but... Wait a minute, is there a... I can get... Yeah, I can get Ike in there. I can get Ike there too, but I believe that's a range attack, so I won't actually be able to activate. Um, I just realized Resolve is still in effect, even though you're in human form. Uh, let's... Hmm. You're gonna, I guess, go down here, and I need to make sure you do this, otherwise you will probably die. That's why I save the Lagoo Stones for. Uh, Nasala, you will... Alright, I can use Vortex, but... <laughs> Nope, bad idea. I'm kind of surprised Nasala's contributing a bit to this fight, which is more than I thought he'd do. Now, this could end right here if Ike gets Ether, but not really going to count on it. Wait, what? Why can't you... Oh, birds don't have Kanto in this game. I forgot about that. Well, it won't be ending right here. But I guess we can have a long-range duel. There's going to be no chance of Aether uh, at this point, but we can see what Gargarunt looks like when it attacks at long range. Still hits just as hard as it usually does. Uh, okay, here is where I need to... So from here, can I get to everyone? Nasala, yep, all three, and I'm out of Ashnard's range. Let's go for Fortify again. As long as you have a good healer with a Fortify Staff, the Ashnard fight's really not that bad. Like, as far as final bosses go in the series, it's not the most interesting of final bosses, because really he's just a big wall of HP with a lot of defense that hits you really hard, but Wrath Resolve is amazing against him, so... Yeah. And, uh, don't think there's anything else to do this turn, really. If he attacks Nasir, he's probably going down. And he did, okay. Well, in fact, for story reasons, it does make a lot of sense for Nasir to be the one to beat him, but Ike usually contributes a lot more to this fight. 
exactly my HP. Please critical. Please. Oh, that wasn't a critical. But that is it. So yes, what we've learned today is that Wrath and Resolve is amazing against Ashnar. Also, Ashnar's defeat quote is really, really weird. Like, it makes sense given his personality, but it, oh, it's such a strange defeat quote for the final boss to have. And yeah, Ashnard is one of the few times in the Fire Emblem series that the big bad evil king, and yep, he's vanished, he's actually dead this time. The big bad evil king is actually the final boss. So, that is the final chapter over. But there is one matter that we have to attend to beforehand. I really like this twist because if you're a long-time fan of the series, you won't really think much about Ashnard's Mound. You'll just be like, oh, it's just a really big wyvern, right? No, it was an actual dragon the whole time. So I guess we did fight a dragon as the final boss in the Fire Emblem game, so we kind of met that quota. But yeah, this was the big secret. This was why Nasir and Ina were traitors. And this is why Ina talked about being close to her beloved. I wonder how many people when they first played suspected that that was Ashnard, but no. Basically, he was a feral one. That's what led Ina to Gritnir Tower, and that's why Nasir was asking Ashnard for a cure.
He wasn't just any uh, one of the Dragon Tribe too, but uh, I'll leave the reveal of exactly who he was to Radiant Dawn because that game explains it. Something that will be relevant to Radiant Dawn though that I will need to talk about here though, Rajon just died. It's not as clear in the English version as it is in the Japanese version, and his dialogue at the very end there when he said let's return to Goldoa together, it's kind of ambiguous and I feel like Japanese is better at conveying ambiguity than English is. A lot of players, uh, a lot of people who played the English version thought that he survived here and that Rayson and Leanne healed him. That is sadly not true, he actually died there, and that will be important in Radiant Dawn. At least, somewhat important. So we have that back. Ash and I won't be misusing that again, and with that, we end the final chapter. All that's left is the epilogue.